my grandparents risked their lives immigrating to the United States in the 60s to escape persecution by the communists. My entire family jokes about how my grandmother has always been some kind of Buddhist sage, but my grandfather has always been more Western. I recently went to visit them. As their favorite grandchild and the only one able to speak Chinese, the whole family has agreed that they would pass down their stories and some family secrets on to me. It's not like my idiot cousins care about them, and my brother is busy with college. As an avid slash ex slash lurker, I thought it would be appropriate to post a very creepy story that my grandfather shared with me. I won't be sharing any family secrets or anything, that's for me to keep to myself. However, I will be providing you all with enough information to understand the context of the situation that they were in. It's a bit of a long one, and it's a little far-fetched, but I will be writing this in a way that makes sense to all of you. This is one that's always stuck, and we've never had any answers for it. I'll try as best I can not to dramatize it or add anything unnecessary. My grandfather was the youngest son of a doctor in a rural farming village in Fujian. For the purposes of this story, I'll call him by the Christian name that he took, Justin. The terrain here was and still is dense with forests and tall grass, and the air was humid and thick. His village was tucked between several large hills and cupped between mountains that stretched upwards into great, green spires. This was a time of great political strife. Dispersed fighting between warlords and rivaling political factions dragged every person into the conflicts. He, being a young boy, was expected to secretly deliver messages for the burgeoning communist forces in the region. Please don't judge him for this, it was a very different time and the factions were constantly at odds. He simply had to make certain choices. He would make the journey from his village to the neighboring village where older communist students and teachers had established a clandestine base of operations, which was probably about 15 or 20 kilometers out, by bicycle. This trek took him through perilous terrain on questionable trails over a swampy forest. He would often make these treks alone in the dead of night, but sometimes he would be accompanied by an older, teenage student for his own protection. We're going to call him Wang. Justin never really liked Wang. He was from a dirt poor family of rice pickers and his only real goal in coming with him would be to have a chance at killing a tiger or a republican soldier with his bamboo spear, which he waved around all the time. Even to young Justin, Wang seemed like a moronic child. He would bark orders at Justin and make too much noise, and he was always afraid that Wang would attract attention. Wang was essentially the old Chinese version of that kid in high school who always wore camo everywhere. On a very foggy evening, Justin was tasked with delivering a large, red envelope to the next town over, like he usually would be. He was not to open this envelope under penalty of death. The moon was dim that night and the teachers who tasked him with the transportation knew it would give him better cover. He met Wang at the edge of the forest as the sun set, his straw hat obscuring his pockmarked face What took you so long, Justin? You realize that this is a very important mission, yes? You have to remember to be on time. Justin rolled his eyes. There was no real set time, and he understood that every mission was very important. Because Wang had no bicycle, so they had to make this trek on foot to stay together. Tonight, unlike usual, Wang took the lead since he was the only one with a lantern. It acted kind of like a flashlight because of the glass opening at the front, but that didn't do much to cut through the fog. Justin needed to keep telling him which roads to take and where to swap off onto new roads that weren't entirely visible, to which Wang would dismiss with Yeah, I knew that. Or right, just as Comrade XI told me. All of his barking began to annoy Justin, but he didn't want him to swing that spear at him, so he just shut up about it. While the first few kilometers of trail were relatively flat and easily accessible, 
they had to dismount the trail and cut left through the swampy areas of the forest to avoid bandits or soldiers. The sun had completely set by this point, and Justin was now thankful that Wang had brought his lantern. Still, the fog obscured their view of anything around them, and the dense grass did nothing to help them. Several times, Justin heard what sounded like two or three people marching around a few meters behind them. Wang also heard this, and they kept quiet as they made their way through. The padding of footsteps against the rocky ground was unnerving. It clearly sounded like several men marching all together alongside them at once, like they were being stalked by a party of soldiers in a line. They increased their pace. Wang decided to stop for a moment to look around just in front of a small ravine that sunk into a babbling stream. Justin noticed that when they stopped, the footsteps behind them marched around in circles for a moment. Then, he heard a shallow thump noise, like someone had dropped an incredibly heavy bag. Wang signaled for Justin to go into the ravine. As he turned around to climb down, Wang directed his lantern toward the forest behind them. Ramrod still, Wang drew his breath and suddenly began yelling and pounding his chest at the brush. He pointed his spear and fell silent again. The two of them heard not just two or four, but several legs stomp on the ground and prance backwards. They heard a large mass whip through the grass like wind, and all of a sudden it was gone. Wang began laughing and loudly congratulating himself as they made their way downhill along the stream, but Justin knew better because from behind them, he could still hear distant pattering. Look, Justin. Did you see that? Could you see? I'm like a real hero. There'll be beautiful girls singing songs about me one day. You, too, of course. We're tiger hunters out here. Just as Wang was getting back on track down the ravine, the two of them spun around as a long, exaggerated moan came from the dense forest behind them. It sounded like an abnormally large tiger, and they could hear birds fluttering away from every tree the sound touched. Grandfather recalls knowing immediately that it wasn't a tiger. It sounded like one, but gurgled and distorted. He could only compare them to the helicopters he had heard much later in his life in America, except with a bellowing roar beneath it broken up by each gurgle. The roar trailed off into odd, high-pitched squealing notes, a bit like the whine of cicadas, but more concise and random. The same prattling sound pranced toward them, this time with multiple stomps hitting the ground at a quicker interval. They heard it pouncing around the brush just above them flanking their right side. Immediately, Justin pulled Wang and told him to run. They sprinted down the stream, all the while listening to the multitude of stomping that was keeping pace with them along their right flank just above them on what sounded like dozens of feet blasting into the dirt with each prance. Justin could hear low, loud panting coming from whatever was following them in tandem with each jump that it made, like a running ox. Eventually, they slid under a giant, fallen tree and the stream let off into a wide grove of flat greenery surrounding a large pond. Lotus flowers and water lilies bloomed out from the center of the grove, which Justin knew was not far from the next town. Wang panicked and spun around, and the two of them could see the silhouette of what looked like a tiger atop the fallen tree trunk, just a few meters away from them. At first, Wang shouted that it was a tiger but then started shouting that it was a dragon. Its body was at least three times as long as any tiger they'd seen, and it was moving on three or four pairs of long, muscular legs, which was followed by a long, undulating segment of its body resembling a crocodile tail. The beast moved gracefully, almost like a fish, undulating up and down with every movement all the way to its tail. It seemed to stand head and shoulders above Wang, who was actually tall for his age. Its head was enormous, and it crept toward them with loud stomps. It let out the same long, gurgling moan, except at a much higher pitch. Wang cried out and jabbed at it with his spear. Justin backed up, 
ready to sprint right around the grove and toward the main road. Wang was crying as the creature made tiny snaps at him, now fixated on his spear. Justin could see their silhouettes in the fog as the beast backed him into the water, crouched and ready to tackle him. Even from this position, it came up to Wang's waist. Justin then picked up a handful of mud and threw it at the long, strange creature. It stopped for a moment and shook its head around, groaning in an agitated way, and Wang jammed his spear toward its head. At this point Justin spun around and began running around toward the road. A high-pitched screech filled the air, and Wang made a mad dash into the swampy water. He was clearly trying to swim, but the water was too low for that and the roots of the vegetation and flowers were snagging on his legs. Justin came to the water's edge and reached out for Wang's hand. While he did this, he saw the large, black mass dip head first into the water and disappear. Wang almost reached Justin when he sunk very deep into the mud, to the point that his shoulders were peeking out of the water. He was crying and begging Justin to pull him out. Justin was a small child, though, and could hardly pull Wang against the weight of the mud and water. Wang had nearly gotten his hips out of the water when, suddenly, Justin felt his hand yank back violently from his grasp, and Wang was dragged back toward the water. He shrieked and cried. Justin. Please don't let him take me. Please. Do something, hurry. Please. Wang was grabbing a small tree root and crying out and the creature's maw was now visibly yanking at him horizontally from the water. Justin threw his bag back toward the tree line and grabbed the same root that Wang was grasping to. He began to pull it back, but Wang lost his grip and slid back into the water. Wang flailed around, and Justin saw the creature prance out toward him, its enormous mouth crashed down on his lower back. Wang tried to scream but it only came out as gargled howling. Justin backed up, watching the thing gnash and roll as it dragged him deeper into the grove. He tried flailing away, but he was immediately dragged back under the surface of the water. Justin immediately spun around and dragged his bag with him away from the grove. When he got to the town, the professors commended him for his bravery. He tried to explain how Wang was attacked and eaten by some kind of monster, but the men were too busy with their papers to give it any thought. The students working with the professors told him that he was making it up for more commendations, some students supported him and said that it may have actually been a crocodile or a tiger and that Justin was just delirious. He was, after all, a small child, and small children have big imaginations. The group inevitably lost interest when the professors demanded their attention. Justin stayed the night and then was escorted back to his village with one of the local farmers on his rickshaw in the morning. Wang's family accused him of being a liar and of abandoning their son, but the local communist gangs defended him and shut the family up. The story was quickly hushed, and forgotten within the following months.